As you may or may not have noticed, in the previous devlogs the terrain in my game was very bad, since it was flat and boring, and therefore I scrapped the entire thing and remade it correctly, with some much more interesting noise. But if you're new here, my name is Thor and I'm working on a game currently titled The Scorching Engines, set aboard a giant vehicle in a frozen wasteland where I have to fight for your survival. Still no Steam page as of yet, but I am working on it. Like any good terrain, you need noise. More specifically, procedural noise, where I went with the classic Perlin noise, which is a type of pseudo-random noise, which in our case means that there isn't a large difference in the noise value between two positions right next to each other. By sampling this noise, using the position of our terrain as the input, we get coherent terrain heights back. But using only a single noise sample isn't quite enough, as you get very boring looking terrain, and therefore we have to do multiple samples of noise, known as octaves, where you change the parameters for the terrain function so that each layer has a different scale and contributes less to the shape of the terrain. The first octave is to get the general shape of the terrain, or the hills and valleys. Then you add in some smaller dips and raises for each octave, which generates some terrain that then looks more natural. At the moment, the terrain noise is only two-dimensional. What this means is that the terrain is just a flat surface, pushed up or down to match the noise positions, even though it's a 3D world. I also want the terrain to be more detailed and impressive, such as having overhangs, canyons, cliffs and caves. And additionally, I want the terrain to not just be terrain, but actually add it to the gameplay. So I made it so that there are certain places that are too steep to drive the vehicle up, and I've begun adding certain structures, such as large rocks, that the vehicle cannot drive through, that you then have to drive around, with other structures planned, such as ruins containing vehicle upgrades. I also added in the ability of having seeds, which means that the terrain generation changes with each run, but you can reuse a seed to regenerate the exact same terrain for every run, which is very useful for testing during development, and it might be useful or fun for gameplay later on. I saw a very interesting talk about the terrain generation in Minecraft, which I think I should be able to take some inspiration from in order to improve the look of the terrain in my game for the next revamp. By layering multiple noises on top of each other with different scales and different looks, we can get biomes into the game, where one biome might be generally more flat and plains-like, while another can have cliffs, canyons, mountains and other interesting terrain shapes. Unfortunately, the larger terrain variety and more structures is something I've postponed until the second revamp of the terrain, as spending more time on the terrain generation wouldn't make the game better, seeing how there are other more pressing issues with the gameplay, such as the fact that there currently is way too little stuff to do. Therefore, this terrain rework was combined with a major vehicle redesign as one of the first steps into making the game more fun to play. In all the previous devlogs, the Entity Vehicle was actually just copying the position of the Game Object Vehicle, which had zero capability of changing its height, and also zero knowledge of the ECS world, which is another reason why the terrain used to be so flat, because the vehicle would just drive straight through the terrain. So I rewrote the entire vehicle movement from scratch, with the ability to move along the terrain's shape and angle itself accordingly. The vehicle utilizes multiple sampling points along the edge of the vehicle, where it angles itself along the average surface normal, where the surface normal is the direction that the surface is pointing in. This surface normal is also used to calculate the steepness of slopes, so that the vehicle cannot drive up slopes that are too steep, but it can drive down steep slopes. What this means for gameplay is that you have to be careful where you're driving when being chased by raiders, as you might get stuck or you might drive off a cliff and go plummeting down with no easy way back up. But currently the terrain isn't varied enough to have steep cliffs and canyons, but it is something I'll be adding. I am however unsure if it should damage the vehicle, as I have no idea as to how fun it would be to play with the fall damage for the vehicle. In order to detect whether or not the vehicle is being blocked by structures, I do multiple ray casts in front of the vehicle, where they check if the hit objects contain a blocking tag. And I know that I might be using raycasts a bit too furiously, but at least they're very cheap in terms of CPU cost. And as a bit of an optimization, I also added an early out to the raycasts, where if one raycast is blocking, we don't calculate any additional raycast visualized by the lack of green lines. I'll also let you in on a secret. Quaternions are so awful to work with. 
Well, as you can see, they refused to cooperate, as they kinda blew my vehicle up, made it perform acrobatics, and also made it wiggle a fair bit. But, after a lot of debugging and testing, I finally figured it out, and it all boiled down to one thing. I am very bad at maths. No, but if anyone is actually wondering, it was mostly due to incorrect multiplication orders of the rotation quaternions, as you basically have to have the reverse multiplication order of what you want. In combination with the terrain and vehicle remakes, I also overhauled the shader that does the snow deformation to also show when it's too steep to drive up by replacing the snow texture with a rock texture and, you know, not deforming the rock. But I want a solution that fits into the whole permanent winter apocalypse a bit more than visible rock, considering that it should be covered by snow, so I might swap it for some icy texture instead. Speaking of the snow deformation, in the previous versions I had a camera that only saw the particles used for the snow deformation and then displayed this deformation onto a flat plane using a render texture. However, due to the fact that the snow was a flat plane, the terrain was sticking up through the snow sometimes which looked very bad, and the shape of the snow was also not affected by the shape of the terrain. So in some situations you could dip down below the snow. To remedy this I had to update the shader so that it worked with the meshes used for the terrains instead of having a flat plane overlaid on top. But the UV coordinates of the meshes were mapping incorrectly into the render texture used to display the snow deformation. Previously the flat plane mapped directly one to one into the render texture, which means that what the camera could see was exactly the same size as the plane. For the new solution I calculated the UV coordinates of the meshes by projecting their coordinates into the render texture. This is done by calculating whether or not they fit inside the camera bounds and world space, which I know sounds complicated, but it's actually pretty simple to implement, as you can see in the shader graph, where it's only a couple of nodes. I've put this part of the terrain development at the end of the devlog, as it is a bit more technical. As you can see, the terrain generation performance is pretty good. But in order to get it to be this fast, I had to do multiple redesigns of the implementation and algorithm. The previous solution had a 3x3 grid size, resulting in 9 terrain pieces that each had a chunk size of 50, i.e. they were 51 by 51 vertices. These 9 terrain pieces were then moved in a leapfrog pattern whenever the player crossed the boundaries, which means that the row furthest from the player was moved ahead of the player and regenerated, causing large stutters. The new solution is a lot faster and a lot simpler. Additionally, it also looks much better, has better terrain generation, as well as having more user configurability. I started off by splitting the terrain into chunks, just like the old solution, where I can easily adjust the chunk sizes, i.e. how many vertices make up a chunk, and the grid size, which affects how many chunks there are in the world where a chunk size of 50 gives us terrain pieces of 2600 vertices. Follow that with a grid size of 13 and we get 169 chunks, which amounts to 440,000 vertices for the entirety of the terrain. This is 160 chunks more than the previous solution, while running a lot faster. However, since the distance between vertices is sufficiently small, I made it so that the colliders use a simplified mesh where I can change the scaling used, where currently it's at 30%, so that the colliders are only 15 vertices in terms of the chunk size, which means that the meshes are 2600 vertices, but the colliders are only 225. Seeing how the collider generation was the biggest bottleneck in the previous terrain implementation, this gave us a massive performance improvement, as the collider generation time scales almost linearly with the number of vertices in the collider's mesh. As another performance change, I made it so that the terrain generation is split over multiple frames instead of all being done in a single frame, which while not generating the terrain faster, does reduce the number of stutters to only having a slightly lower frame rate for a bit, instead of the game freezing. Additionally, I added the option to scale the terrain pieces, which increases the distance between vertices, resulting in lower quality. Which could be used as a form of level of detail in the future, but currently I'm just using it to have a larger view distance without having more chunks, since each chunk is now physically larger. But now there's still the task of what to do when the player moves over a chunk border. I made it so that whenever the player crosses a border, it spawns new pieces up to the grid size away, 
and removes already generated chunks that are too far away. In other words, it's basically like Minecraft's render distance. And now for some funkiness regarding Unity ECS and mono behaviors. Me being me, I was dissatisfied with the performance of the ECS terrain system, as it felt like it was lower than it should be. Which I quickly managed to figure out was because of some very severe archetype chunk fragmentation. Each terrain chunk also got assigned its own archetype chunk, which means that each terrain piece reserved 16 kilobytes of memory, resulting in a lot of extra memory usage where an archetype chunk is a sort of bucket for all of the entities matching an archetype. On top of this, chunk fragmentation is also really bad for the performance, as the CPU cannot quickly iterate over entities not in the same chunks. Therefore, I split each terrain piece up into two entities, one for logic, i.e. the colliders and render distance checks, as this meant that all logic pieces could be in the same archetype chunks and one entity that only contained the mesh. This actually improved the performance a fair bit, since all the physics calculations were now faster since the terrain colliders were nicely laid out in memory. But the render performance was still sub-par. This is due to the fact that meshes are shared components in Unity Dots, and the fact that each terrain piece has a unique mesh. Therefore, each visual entity got assigned its own archetype chunk, which led to some performance issues where you can see that when the entities were combined, I could only fit 80 of them into each chunk due to each entity being 204 bytes. However, I only had one entity in each chunk, leading to there being a whopping 6,000 archetype chunks of entities. Allocating 93 megabytes of memory, but only using 1.6 megabytes. After splitting the terrain entities into two entities, logic and visual, I increased the terrain size, leading to 10,000 terrain chunks, i.e. 10,000 of each entity type. With the collider entities, I can fit 122 of these into each archetype chunk, leading to the game only using 96 chunks to store all of the terrain logic, using only 1.3 megabytes with the only wasted memory being a partially full archetype chunk, having room for 4 more logic entities. Also, 122 entities per archetype chunk is very good, as Unity has an internal limit of 128 entities per chunk. The visual entities, however, are still bad. Still only 204 bytes per entity, making Unity think that it can fit 80 of these into each archetype chunk. But due to the chunk fragmentation, they have now reserved 158 megabytes of memory, wasting 155 megabytes, or 98%. Using 10,000 archetype chunks and having room for 800,000 more entities in those chunks. And you start to get a sense of why the performance is bad. I mean, it's still running at around 100 FPS, but it should still be a lot higher as I had most of the game's features turned off, including resources. In order to fix this issue, I actually had to do something unexpected. I had to keep the logic entities since they were performing great but I had to replace all the visual entities with game objects. Which, although I know sounds bad, considering that I've been talking bad about game objects for multiple devlogs, solved a lot of my issues. The rendering performance isn't strictly better, since there's still as many unique meshes and as many vertices. However, they are using less memory since they aren't reserving thousands of archetype chunks, and therefore they aren't slowing down everything in the ECS simulation, leading to significantly faster CPU frame times. In order to still have good performance for the render distance, all distance checks are done against the logic entities. I then had to add a linking component to the logic entities, so that they know which game object they are linked to, so that if they are too far away, we use this game object linking component to delete the game object together with the entity. This change to having game objects for the visuals and entities for the logic saved us a bunch of memory and improved the CPU performance of the terrain drastically. The question of whether or not this would noticeably affect players during gameplay with a normal render distance is one I can't really provide a proper answer to. But I love games with a high render distance and I really like optimizations, in stark contrast to many newly released games. So I partially did it because it's fun and because I want as many people as possible to be able to play my game. However, I hope that this technical dive in the end of the devlog wasn't too in-depth and if it was, then please let me know so I can improve future devlogs.